Hello and welcome everybody. So this is section 17 of the notes and here we'll, here we will start discussing robust regression. That is regression estimates which work well in the presence of outliers. And in this first video I want to explain to you first what outliers are and I want to show you that the least squares regression method, the estimate we used before, that that behaves poorly in the presence of outliers. So let's start with what are outliers. Okay, so technically an outlier is just a data point, so say one of the pairs x, i, y, i, which significantly differs from the rest of the data. So for simple linear regression, it could be if here's x, i, here's y, i, and the points assume they are all somewhere here. So there's lots of points here, then any point which is not together with the others might be an outlier. And that could be benign and not a problem, namely this black point I just drew, that could just be one sample which was measured to explore the extremes, but that lies on the same line as the others, so that's really not a problem. But if a point was here, then clearly that line we fitted to the other points would not be a good model to describe this point. And the other way around, if we now fit a regression line including this point, it would probably come out something like this and would no longer be a good fit to these points. So that point here seems to indicate a problem. And in general, there is just no clear rule what to do with outliers. So you need to study them individually. Sometimes they indicate errors in the data collection procedure. I don't know, maybe a minus 10 was somewhere recorded as a plus 10 or or maybe some old data has been used instead of current data, or I don't know what, it can go wrong in many ways. But sometimes it just means either we have an x value which is a bit different than the others, and maybe that's actually a good thing because it gives us a larger range of samples to look at, and sometimes it's just fluctuations. So if that is the band where most of the values lie in, if that is something like a 95% confidence band, then one out of 20 values would be outside, and sometimes you just get large values. So that may be a one in a thousand error, but you know, if you take many samples, you may see a one in a thousand event from time to time. So outliers could be random fluctuations. They could, if they are out here or out there, be just valid data, or they could be errors, and there is no way whether you should keep them because they are precious, like these two samples tell you much about the slope, so they, these are precious samples, but sometimes they are errors and should be thrown out, so you need to investigate outliers. And what I want to talk about here is how to recognize outliers. And that's not as trivial as it sounds, so first in higher dimensions it's not easy to make a plot always, and if we do a different kind of picture and for a second just assume we just have the x values here. So outside the screen perpendicular to what I have drawn should be a y-axis, and that is both inputs. So if we just think our inputs are here, though that's not required to be linear, let's just assume the curves a bit here for some reason. So y, which is not shown, is meant to be a linear or affine function of the x, but here I just drew x. Then this new point I drew in red, if you look at this picture, is an outlier, but if you think you can see only x1 and x2 separately, so x1 has this range and the red point is here that is on the edge but does not look particularly suspicious, and similarly the range of x2 is this and the outlier lies even more in the range, so here you see if you look just at each variable individually, then you would not discover that something is special about the red point, and only on this cutter plot, which has x1 and x2, you see that point is definitely an unusual x value and would probably be classed as an outlier. And, well, in higher dimensions, you just can't plot the data like that anymore, so if you have 10 inputs, there are effects where on every one or two dimensional plot the value seems to be perfectly in range, but still, like in this plot, it is away from the others. So we need some quantitative measures for whether a point is an outlier or not. And I want to discuss two of these, and the first one is called leverage. So the definition is the leverage of an input xi is the 
HII's diagonal element of the hat matrix, so that's what we called HII earlier, and that's XI transpose, X transpose, X inverse, XI, if you want to expand it, but uh, still it's the I's diagonal element of the hat matrix. The reason that that's a relevant quantity is the lemma I prove in the notes, and here let me just show you what that is. So claim is if I look at the fitted value at some at xi. So y hat i is the value of our regression line or hyperplane, the fitted value at this point xi. And then I asked how strongly does this depend on the data at the point i? Then for that I could use the derivative, so I change the data yi and see how strongly does the fitted value follow along. And that derivative, if we work that out, so that's d over dyi, and then the fitted values we know, well, y hat is hy, i, and that is d over dyi, and then hyi is some j from 1 to n, h i j y j. And now if you take this derivative, well, first it can go into the sum, but then you see the y's are here, there are n of them, but we are taking derivative with respect to yi, so we are changing only one input and keep the others fixed. So most of these terms don't contribute to the derivative. So the derivative of something times y1 is 0 if i is not 1, of y2 is 0 if i is not 2, and so on. And the only term we get to keep here is if y equals i. So what we get is j i from 1 to n, h i j, and then d over d y i y j, and this is 1 if i equals j and 0 otherwise, so that is h i i. Good, that's the leverage. So we have the fitted value, if I change the data, moves also, and it does not depend on what the value before was. The speed of movement is h i i, the leverage. And that just means at locations where that is large, the regression line or the regression hyperplane depends strongly on the data. And where that is small, it does not depend strongly on the data. And the logic is, if we have some points here and another point here, then that should have large leverage, because if I do a line here, if I move that point down, then probably the regression line will just follow along, and this here will effectively be like one single point concentrated here. So if the distance is large, then I would expect the leverage to be close to one, namely if I move this down one unit, then the line will also go down one unit. And in contrast, if we have the points here, and then we have a point in here which we could think of moving up and down, then I would think this pivoting cannot happen, and that line will just go up a bit or down a bit, but then it is 10 points against one point or something like this, so in this case the line will only move a little if I move this point up and down. So this point I would think will have small leverage. And we are looking at x space outliers here, so this point here to go with this is not an x space outlier and has small hii, whereas the point I drew earlier that has large hii, and that I would class as an outlier also. And it turns out that is just a measure whether a point is an outlier in x direction or not, so if it's large leverage we can consider a point to be an x space outlier, and if it's small leverage it may still be off in y direction like this one, but it will be in the bulk of the other points in x direction. And that measure still works in situations in higher dimensions where, as I said earlier, we cannot easily plot a picture. Good, so let me try to demonstrate this with a short animation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement something very much like this in R, and I'm taking only one point, so this one, and then I'm going to move this about. So I will have this here, move it up and down a bit, and then I move it here and move it up and down a bit, and you will see when I'm here the line goes up and down a bit, and if I'm off-center the slope will change, but not dramatically, whereas if I'm out here and move the point up and down, then the slope of the line will change a lot, and it will kind of pivot around the center of mass of these points. So let's have a look. So the red point is the outlier I'm moving up and down. And you see, currently I'm doing that in the middle of the black points, and consequently the regression line doesn't change very much, really, and just moves up and down, really. 
Now, if I move the red point further out to the right, you see the regression line starts tilting and the reaction is much, much stronger. So now it changes considerably and follows the red point. So coming back to that picture, what we have seen is the regression line reacts strongly to points like this one and it reacts less strongly to points in this region and that is reflected by the leverage. So we know in this one dimensional situation here points will be have large leverage and here points will have small leverage and we can use this to detect outliers in x direction so large leverage means it's an x space outlier. And before we go on I want to discuss two extra aspects here. Namely, the first one is we have earlier discussed the influence of an observation. That's a similar concept. So for the influence, we used Cook's D. And Di was the difference between beta hat when we removed the ice observation and beta hat with the ice observation in. And then what we did is we took some clever norm. So we used x transpose x inverse here as a covariance matrix and then we scaled it with I think p plus 1 sigma h squared or something. Good, so that is another measure for how much does the regression line change. Here it's expressed in terms of the regression coefficients but that will easily translate into a change of the regression line and we did actually have a lemma which said that thing here can be written as the norm of the vector y hat with the i sample omitted minus y hat squared and that was now the usual Euclidean norm and it was scaled in the same way. So I think still p plus 1 times sigma hat squared. Good, so how is this different from that? Well, here the difference is actual difference. So here we said the regression line did actually change, whereas that measures potential distance, it just says if we would choose y, how much would the regression line change. So here with this point we can see that that red point perfectly lies on the regression line of the other point, so if I remove this point, the regression line will not actually change. Well, depends on where exactly it is, but there is a point here where the red point could be present or not present and the line stays the same. And that point has still high leverage, because if I would move it up and down the regression line would change, but it has zero influence because if I remove it, the regression line does not change at all. So that distance or that distance would be zero. Okay, so what that means is leverage is potential effect on the regression line if we would move the sample, whereas influence is actual effect where adding the sample actually made a difference. Good, that is one thing. And the other thing I want to discuss is I wrote large leverage here, but I have not actually said what does large mean, so we should think a bit about that. So the leverage is HII, which is the i's diagonal element of the hat matrix. And we have learned something about this earlier, namely earlier we learned that some HII is the trace of the hat matrix, and if you know a bit of linear algebra that is easy to work out, namely that the trace of x, x transpose x inverse x transpose. And there is this funny rule for the trace, you can do a cyclic shift, so trace of ABC, if you change the order in a circle, then you would get trace BCA, for example, and that's the same. You are not allowed to swap two, but you are allowed to do cyclic shifts like that. And that rule is a bit funny, if the matrices are not square, it still works, so that ABC may have a different dimension than BCA as long as all the products exist. So I'm allowed to move the non-square matrix X over. So I can write x transpose x inverse x transpose x and then that trace of the identity matrix and here we just need to work out the size. So x is n by p, so x transpose is p by n and x transpose x is p by p, same logic, and x transpose x inverse is also p by p, so the whole thing is a p by p matrix and then that trace here is also the trace of a p by p identity matrix so that's p. Good, so the sum of the leverages is p. So we get average leverage is, is p over n, and I just noticed I made a mistake. And um, if we include the intercept as we have been doing here, it's p plus 1. 
we need to adjust this here, p plus 1. Now it's fixed, so it's p plus 1 over n. My apologies about the typo. Good. So that already gives us some scale. And a problem is we have no statistical model for the x values, and that's completely computed from the x values, so we cannot speak of typical values or so. Anything of this can happen, but we have, one can prove, an upper and a lower bound. So the upper bound is quite logical if you think about that derivative. So that is how strongly does the regression line react if you change y. And if you think back to the video, the regression line was always lagging behind a bit. So if I move the red point down a unit, then the regression line may come the same distance, but it will not kind of overshoot or do anything like this. So the fitted value always moves less than the data point. And that means the derivative is always less than 1. And one can show hii less than 1 for all i. Good, so that's an upper bound. So on average, they are p plus 1 over n. In the movie, I just showed p was 1, so we would have 2 over n, and at most 1. And there is also a lower bound, which is a bit more difficult to show, and we are not going to use it. I'm just going to tell you here, the lower bound is 1 over n. And that is actually a relatively severe lower bound, namely if you think, if you add all of them, that thing here will already add up to 1. So the sum, even if they are all as small as possible, would be at least 1, and then we know really the sum equals p plus 1. I fixed it now. And in the movie, p was 1, so the sum is 2, so probably there all of them were very close to 1 over n, except for the far out one at the end that probably was very close to 1, and then it all balances out. But whatever. So we don't have typical values because we have no statistical model for the x, but we know that's the average value exactly, and that is the range of possible values. Good. And that's all I want to tell you here about leverage. So large values mean x space outliers, but outlier is not a precisely defined concept, and consequently our criterion also cannot be a precise concept. Good. So then you should have a look in the notes. I do an example there where I plot leverage against influence, because again, these are related concepts, and it turns out you can get some interesting plots there, but I'm not going to try to sketch these on the tablet, so have a look in the notes. Great. So that was what I wanted to tell you about X-space outliers. And about y-space outliers, my suggestion would be to just look at the residuals. So if you think back to what we saw in the video I showed, there we had our data, and then we had our outlier here, and what they did is it was just moving the regression line up or down a bit. At this point, we can easily detect by it having a bigger distance to the regression line than the other points. So my proposal for detecting y-space outliers would be the residuals, so epsilon hat i, the difference between the regression line and the data. And before we use these, we need to scale them a bit. And we have everything in place for that. So we know epsilon hat is y minus y hat. So it's identity minus hat matrix times y. And then with our statistical model, it's identity minus hat matrix x beta plus epsilon, and we have shown at some point identity minus h times x is zero, so that whole term goes away, and we get identity minus h epsilon. That's using some result from section four. Good, and then we can immediately see epsilon hat is normally distributed, and the mean is zero because epsilon has zero mean. And the covariance matrix, well, epsilon has covariance matrix sigma squared times identity. And this matrix we get twice. So we have this times sigma squared identity times identity minus h transpose. But that is a matrix, so we don't need the transpose. And it's idempotent, so what we really get is sigma squared identity minus h. Good. So that's what we have. And the key point of that is that on the diagonal has the variances of the epsilon hat i, and that's not the same throughout. So the epsilon hat i have slightly different variances, and we now know what it is. So variance epsilon hat i is sigma squared 1 minus hii. Good. So before we can compare the residuals to say what is an outlier, we should standardize them 
by doing that. And we don't know sigma squared, so instead we will use the estimated sigma squared. And that is then traditionally called to studentize a random variable if we divide by the empirical standard deviation, because normally you get a student t distribution then. So that's called Ri, the studentized residual is epsilon hat i. We would like to divide by sigma times square root 1 minus hii. We can't do that, so we divide by sigma hat, the estimated standard deviation of the errors. Good. So that is the studentized residuals, and I give a proof in the lecture notes they indeed follow a student t distribution, so it's t n minus p minus 1. We can show, and it's not difficult. Good, and now we know if the model is correct, how large should these residuals be typically. Namely, we can just look at quantiles from that, like when we do a t-test, and we can get some band, and if these values are in the band, if the values computed from data, then all is fine. And if they are outside the band, we need to see how far out are they and how often should that happen. So you can take quantiles that they are outside, I don't know, maybe one times in a thousand only, and then if it's outside, I'd call it the outlier. So you need to invent some cutoff. If you use a 95% band, you need to be a bit careful. That means one sample out of 20 is expected to be out. So if you have more than 20 data points, you get some points out which are not outliers, but just follow the model. But that gives you a scale to look at. So if the studentized residuals are large, just write it in quotation marks here, then we say we have a Y space outlier. Good, and that's what I want to tell you about outliers. So the rest of this part of the module will be about how to deal with outliers. Now we know how to describe them. And we will discuss regression methods, new ways of computing the estimator, which work even if there are outliers in the data. Okay, so this is the end of what I want to say about outliers. And in the next video, the second one for this section, I want to tell you what the breakdown point of a method is. So see you in a minute.